Hello, everyone. Father Ignatius John Schweitzer here, Dominican priest at St. Catherine of Siena Parish and Priory in New York City, and continuing our dialogue series, Immersed in Blood and Fire, Dialoguing with St. Catherine and with God. And we're up to episode number 12 now, Conference 12. We're on the chapter on divine providence, looking at the second half of that chapter on divine providence tonight, pages 300 to 325. And just so you know, uh, there won't be the option of questions tonight. I'm actually pre-recording this. I now have a commitment on Thursday nights. So after this episode, we have two more. Uh, they'll also be pre-recorded. Uh, so we're coming here to the end of the dialogue. I'm gonna finish strongly. And tonight, uh, the second half of the chapter on divine providence, we're going to look especially at St. Uh, Catherine's treatment of poverty of spirit and how that poverty of spirit helps us to grow in trust in God, helps us to grow in joy and freedom as well. So we'll open up that aspect of divine providence and how it's our poverty of spirit that really opens us to God's goodness to receive his superabundance, even in unexpected ways, as we humbly and reverently submit to God's unfolding plan in our lives. So before we dive into this, uh, let's dive into prayer. We'll turn first to our Blessed Mother, asking for her continued prayers for us. We pray, remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, our mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer us. Amen. God of love, we trust you. Help us to trust in you more, in your mysterious ways. Help us to hand ourselves over entirely to you and all that we do. And then follow you in poverty of spirit and freedom of spirit. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. St. Catherine of Siena, pray for us. Holy Father, St. Dominic, pray for us. Holy Father, St. Francis, Pray for us, St. Thomas Aquinas. Pray for us, St. Joseph. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. You'll notice I uh, prayed also to our Holy Father, St. Francis. So I don't know if you know the tradition, but Dominicans also call Francis our Holy Father, and Franciscans also call St. Dominic their Holy Father. There's a great brotherhood there. And we'll see some of that brotherhood, that link between Franciscans and Dominicans tonight as we look at St. Catherine's emphasis on poverty of spirit. And she'll use language reminiscent of St. Francis, lady poverty, queen poverty, being espoused to poverty uh, as, as a bride. And so to note the Franciscan influence in, in her life as well, more on that in, in a second. So we'll open up this side of St. Catherine's trust in divine uh, providence, that poor, humble abandonment of ourselves to God, even when it means that we're, we're left poor materially. And in that poverty, especially the poverty spirit, we do find God's abundance. So St. Catherine will open that up for us. And then we'll also use uh, this episode um, and some of the things she says in this 25 page second section, 300 to 325, she talks some about our human relationships. And to, to realize that Catherine had special friendships, she was very affectionate with her friends and to see how she talks about that and how divine providence is also involved in our human relationships. And we can have holy friendships that spur us on to virtue and help us to grow in holiness with God. And even sometimes those holy friendships, we can find our hearts being maybe too attached to the person, and then God has to kind of draw us away. So it's still a good friendship, but we're a little too attached. And so God's providence uses all those things to use friendship 
and affection and friendships um, in a way that lead, leads us to God. So we'll see how St. Catherine navigates those waters and uh, shows us the way forward in that. And we'll see how she herself struggled kind of with this area. She had an affection in nature and we'll see how affectionate she was in some of her friendships and how uh, she also sometimes realized her heart was a bit too attached to this person or that person and God would wean her heart away and there'd be detachments uh, and kind of some disappointments here and there, but all in God's plan, all in God's providential plan, guiding our events and day-to-day -day life, guiding our relationships to find God at work in our lives. But uh, first, we'll, we'll start with this theme of a poverty of spirit in St. Catherine. This trust in divine providence, we could place under also, we could place under the theological virtue of faith, but also hope, divine providence and hope and divine providence, hope in God's provision. And it's interesting that St. Catherine of Siena makes a similar move that St. John the Cross makes and others make. And John the Cross makes this rather explicit. He makes it explicit that paired up with the theological virtue of hope is poverty of spirit, empty hands. Right? So we hope most in God. The theological virtue of hope is most uh, exercise, not when like everything seems to be going well for us, uh, but when the deck is stacked against us, it feels when things are seeming to fall apart, when we have no other place to turn for our hope but God. That's when our hope is really being purified. When we're poor in spirit, when we have only empty hands to offer to the Lord, uh, then the theological virtue of hope is exercised even more perfectly because then God alone is our hope. And hope is a theological virtue that has God as its object. So as it has God more and more precisely uh, and exclusively as its object, it's an even more perfect act of hope. And so that's a point made strongly by John the Cross, pairing up poverty of spirits, empty hands with the theological virtue of hope. And Catherine uh, does basically the same thing in these pages of the dialogue uh, that we'll look at this evening. And we have, when we approach the Lord with empty hands in that poverty of spirit, we're actually uh, creating space for the Lord to fill. It was a key theme in the Beguines, a couple, a generation and two before St. Catherine, you have the Beguines, and they like to emphasize a collection of uh, female mystics, mostly, and they like to emphasize the abyss of our nothingness, the abyss of our poverty, and the abyss of God's plenitude, the abyss of God's plenitude. And that our poverty is, uh, the abyss of our poverty is, is quite a good partner. Uh, for the abyss of God's plenitude and makes a space for it. So we'll see St. Catherine play with those same ideas. You know, we, we saw it already when she speaks about God as he who is, uh, and she as she who is not, the abyss of her nothingness, yet the abyss of God's plenitude that we receive uh, in our nothingness, in our receptivity, in our need. And so St. Catherine in these pages too will talk about the abyss of God's goodness, the abyss that is his divine providence, his provision for us, that abyss, and um, our corresponding emptiness that receives that abyss, the abyss of our nothingness uh, that receives that. So she's building on themes that, you know, generation or two earlier uh, had been um, working out and um, she can kind of be seen as, or the beginnings can be seen as preparing the way for uh, Catherine of Siena, in a way. Angela Foligno. Foligno is not that far from Siena. She was a third order uh, Franciscan, and she was one of the beginnings and loved to talk about the double abyss, the abyss of our nothingness, the abyss of God's plenitude. And then, you know, generation or two later, Catherine of Siena picks that up in her own way as well. Let me, let me turn this light off real quick. So we'll, we'll dive in and see how uh, St. Catherine 
uh, talks about these things. Let me pull up my PowerPoint slide here. So our, our title for tonight, The Poor in Spirit and Their Trust, Joy, and Freedom. All right, poverty of spirit, it opens up that space for the Lord, but it, it also helps us to trust in God more than ourselves, right? We need to be humble, knowledge of self, leading to a greater knowledge of God. No longer trusting in ourselves, but trusting in God and our poverty of spirit. And it, it's the trials of life that God allows in his divine providence that help us to trust not so much in ourselves, but in him. And it's not just enough for us to make a decision. Oh, I'm just going to trust in God, not in myself. No, it's a lifelong kind of process. We need weaned from our trust in ourselves to trust entirely in God. And from that comes joy and freedom. Freedom of spirit when we're poor in spirit, not so attached to this or that. And being detached, we're free, free for God's will, free to go with or without. Like St. Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content. And when things are well provided and in my poverty, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4. So that poverty of spirit helps us to grow in trust, joy, and freedom. We'll see St. Catherine say all these things. So some of this is we covered uh, last month, but just to kind of get us back in the frame of mind of divine providence and our title last month was something about God's, all God's ways are mystery, are full of mystery and love. All God's ways are full of mystery and love. And it's this humble poverty of spirit that recognizes God's ways are mysterious and accepts God's mysterious ways, surrenders to him, realizing we're small in ourselves. We don't know that much. And God's plans are bigger than our ideas. God's plans are larger than our plans. And that, that expands us. That, that should expand us. I mean, it can feel like it's contradicting us at first, but it's meant to expand us. St. Catherine says, whatever God gives or permits, whether pain or illness, in whatever way he gives and permits it with great mystery to make us holy and to give us what we need to be saved. To Raymond of Capua, he says, I would really have preferred that you had gone to France, yet I'm at peace about it because I'm convinced that nothing happens without mystery. Right? God himself is so mysterious, so his actions, too, are going to be filled with mystery. I have told you and you have seen less than a whiff of a droplet, a nothing in comparison to the sea of my providence, God says in this chapter on divine providence. Now that I've spoken to you in general in particular, right? So the little that we do grasp of God's plan, it's, it's just a small droplet compared to the sea, the deep sea, immense mystery of God's will, his wisdom, his providence. I want you to want things to go not your own way, but the way of the one who is. In right? our humility, we know that we are those who are not. That's poverty of spirit. And when we really live in that humble self-knowledge, we're more willing to accept the way of the one who is. You will then be stripped of your own will and clothed in his. Let's accept every circumstance with reverence. It's in letter T30. So we have this language of poverty here being stripped stripped naked, stripped of our own will, clothed in God's will, accepting every circumstance with reverence. And then in our chapter on divine providence in the dialogue, number 149, God says, true, I sometimes bring them to the brink, the brink of destruction, <laughs> the brink of utter dire need. True, I sometimes bring them to the brink so that they will better see and know that I can and will provide for them so that they will fall in love with my providence and embrace true poverty as their bride. All right, so in that poverty, we no longer trust in ourselves, um, but trust in God's providence. And we're brought to the brink of the cliff, the edge of uh, the gulf, 
and we see God provide, and we see that he is trustworthy, and we see that in our own poverty, we couldn't find a way out. We couldn't provide, but God does. So all these things that rub us the wrong way and God's plan of, of providence, um, it can feel like a contradiction, but it is meant to expand us. So I like this image of St. Catherine, right? Uh, she has a stigmata. She's suffering the cross. Uh, yet there's a great mystery <laughs> that she's before, and it's bigger than she can contain. And so you see her kind of expanding before God's mystery in this beautiful uh, image here. In Dialogue 148, so this is still our chapter, God the Father says, Enlarge your heart, daughter, and open your mind's eye to the light of faith. Right, Not seen with the light of your intellect, but with the light of faith. And enlarge your heart. See with what great love and providence I have created and ordained humankind to rejoice in my supreme eternal reward. And at the end of this chapter, I say only my soul that you have tasted and seen the abyss of supreme eternal providence, the abyss of God's provision for us. Abyss calls to abyss, the abyss of our nothingness calls out to the abyss of God's poverty, of God's plenitude, his superabundance. You know, this theme of poverty Um, and being wedded, so she'll later speak of being wedded to queen poverty, lady poverty, and sounds a lot like Franciscan language. And it's worth noting that, well, first of all, how Franciscan Italy is. So I went to Italy the first time this past summer in June, late June, and I was just, I was surprised. I didn't realize this, but how St. Francis has shaped so much of Italy and Catholic culture there and uh, Catholic spirituality and how much Italians love uh, St. Francis. I, I never picked up on that before except being there. And yeah, it's worth, um, I mean, if it makes sense, you know, Francis does have something of an Italian temperament with that passion, that great love, that, that ardor, and that he was such an amazing figure that he does leave his stamp on Italy and uh, Catholic Italy. And so um, St. Catherine's father, you know, her um, blood father, uh, was a third order Franciscan. So she must have surely felt something of the Franciscan spirituality in her own household and through her father, um, leading the family in the ways of, 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 of the faith. Uh, interestingly enough, I just learned another tidbit about a Franciscan influence on St. Catherine from a Franciscan. So he was actually here at St. Catherine of Siena Priory doing a week-long retreat, and uh, I helped lead him on a retreat on St. Catherine of Siena. And so he wanted to go deeper in St. Catherine, this good Franciscan. And so we did that, and he pointed out that there was a church in Siena run by the Franciscans, and that St. Catherine was known to go there as well. So she would go to the San Domenico uh, church, which I visited in Siena as well. It's the same church that Catherine would have visited. And But there was also in Siena a Franciscan church where she would attend as well, and that she would have heard Franciscan preaching there. So when we hear language of Catherine here in a couple more slides, um, talking about lady poverty, queen poverty, and being espoused to poverty. Uh, there is something of the, uh, the Franciscan influence there. Um, yeah, a good, good Franciscan influence. Um, uh, Holy Father Francis, uh, pray for us. Um, and so, yeah, to appreciate that. So we will see more of that as, as we continue here. In this theme of poverty of spirit, Again, it's poverty of spirit that really helps us to have true, authentic hope, hope in God alone, right? When John the Cross went on, was on his deathbed, his fellow friars were gathered around his deathbed, and they talked about all the great things he did during his life, and uh, St. John was kind of horrified. He said, no, 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 not that, not that. My only hope is the blood of Jesus. My only hope is the blood of Jesus, right? That's that poverty of spirit. 
that finds our only hope in God and in the blood of Jesus. And so a lot of distress that God allows in this life, right, at first can strike people as like an argument against God's providence. Like, really? Okay. Uh, God is provident, really? But like, why does this happen? How did that happen? Um, it seems like I have a tough time sometimes. You know, how can God allow that? Uh, it, it's <laughs> in St. Augustine's time. So he, he writes about this in his commentary on the Psalms. There was an argument against divine providence um, saying um, <laughs> it was like, um, how, how can God let rain fall in the middle of the sea and yet let a drought happen on, on like a, a field of, you know, some farm out in the meadows? Uh, really, God's providence, he's letting rain fall on the on the sea, this great body of water. And this field over here is not receiving any water. Uh, really, like, come on, like God's providence. That was kind of a, a dig at the idea of Christians promoting, you know, God as, as all loving, all good. Uh, so that's in St. Augustine's time. And he refers to this as he's uh, preaching on the Psalms. And so, you know, these kind of arguments, it's not like they're new or they're just a modern phenomenon. They, they've been around. Um, and to uh, recognize, yeah, how God, why God allows things like that, hardship in this life. Well, because his plan is bigger than ours. All his ways are marked with mystery and, and with love. And he has the bigger picture in mind, right? He has our eternity in mind, eternal life with him. And he wants us not just to be good, nice people. Uh, he wants us to be saints. And in our fallen condition to become saints we do need to be brought through the furnace. We do need to be brought into difficult situations uh, where there's we're placed in situations where we're called to real heroism, heroic virtue, right? That only comes out in difficulties. And to uh, appreciate that, it's the spiritual values he's most interested in. And the, yeah, in the light of eternity, this life is uh, rather short a few twinkles in the eye. Uh, don't wait for time, St. Catherine says, because time won't wait for you. We are kind of on a mad uh, dash into eternity. And so, yeah, the trials of this life, when seen in that light, and that they're meant to expand our heart, uh, they're meant to produce heroic virtue in us, uh, they're meant to produce patience, perseverance, courage in us, uh, the threefold crown of charity, um, then we can appreciate more. And part of another reason for this, for distress in life is, to, is for humility, right? Where we're, we're puffed up. Pride is kind of the key sin. All other sins follow after that, self-love and pride, the root of all sin. Pride is how Satan fell and um, how Adam and Eve fell. You know, everything else follows from that. So we, we have to overcome our pride. And so the trials, difficulties of life help us in, in that. And the, the trials and distress of life help us to trust in God more than ourselves, to hope in God, hope in God alone, a more pure act of the theological virtue of hope. And so that's how, that's why we have distress in this life and God's plans, plan allows it um, for these reasons. And it's to engender this poverty of spirit, this beautiful poverty of spirit. So God uh, says, St. Catherine hears him say, Dialogue 144, and why do I keep this, this soul surrounded by so many enemies and such pain and distress? Not for her to be captured and lose the wealth of grace, but to show her my providence, so that she will trust not in herself, but in me, God says. Then she will rise up. Right? This kind of stirring of our ardor, difficulties can call forth the best in us. It can call forth something in us that wouldn't have come out otherwise. Then she will rise up from her carelessness and her concern will make her run for protection to me, her defender, her kind father, the provider of her salvation. Right? We find that a lot. And, you know, a lot of a lot of people who don't pray much or are just beginning to pray. What is it that makes them really pray with ardor? It's when they really need something. When they're lacking something and they really need it, and they're distressed, and that's when they really cry out to the Lord. That's really when they cast themselves on the Lord, and that's when they can really grow in intimacy with the Lord. 
as they approach him with desire and yearning, and as they have nowhere else to turn but to him. And they plead, they plead, they cry out. And so the Lord continues to use that throughout our whole lives. I mean, hopefully as we grow in the spiritual life, it's less you know, our own self-concern that we're crying out for help for, or even our physical need even. You know, and so maybe that's why crying out for spiritual causes uh, and crying out, you know, for like uh, conversion in the world, um, renewal in the church. It can seem like it's a never winning battle sometimes on all these fronts. Uh, but it seems like the Lord really loves when we just cry out to him in desperation. And when we cry out to him in desperation, uh, that can that are those are the most times we're most bound to him. We're closest to him. We're clinging and we're we're approaching him with great desire. And so to not lose heart and despair when we're not seeing much happening in the world or for other things we're praying for, but to keep at it and keep pleading. And that's bringing about a deeper relationship with the Lord. So God's providence allows for all of that, guides us through all of that. And he continues here in this passage. I want her to be humble, to see that of herself she is nothing. The abyss of our poverty, the abyss of God's plenitude. And to recognize that her existence and every gift beyond that comes from me, that I am her life. She will recognize this life and my providence when she is liberated through these struggles. For I do not let these things last forever. They come and go as I see necessary for her, these trials. Sometimes she will think she's in hell. And then through no effort of her own, she will be relieved and will have a taste of eternal life. The soul is left serene. What she sees, what she sees, seems to cry out that God is all aflame with loving fire. What she sees in his providence, what she sees in the unfolding events, all seem to cry out that God is all aflame with loving fire as she now contemplates my providence. Right, so to experience our poverty and to experience the Lord coming to our rescue and providing, we taste it. It's a taste of eternal life. You know, we saw that earlier, knowledge of self, knowledge of God. And St. Catherine says to grow in the knowledge of God in the cell of self-knowledge. So to see our great need and to experience God's goodness, then we know God's goodness in a way that we savor it, we taste it. We just don't know it on like an academic level or a book level just from studying God's goodness. But when you're in great need and God, and you're crying out to God and he comes through, you taste God's goodness. You experience it. Uh, you know it uh, from the inside out. And that's what St. Catherine means by growing in the knowledge of God in the cell of self-knowledge. Seeing how we deserve nothing, how we're nothing on our own, yet seeing how much we have and how it's, how it's a gift from God and how we taste and see the goodness of God that way. All right, so St. Catherine, you know, her concern of, of knowing is, is not so much, you know, book knowledge, but a knowing that leads to loving, that leads to enjoying, tasting, savoring God and his attributes, his goodness, his wisdom, and so forth. And the Lord wants us to grow in humble prayer and to experience um, his goodness through it. Why, when she was faithful to prayer and other necessary things, did I not relieve her with light and take away the darkness? All right, we can ask that in prayer a lot. Why does God leave us in darkness and dryness? Since she was still imperfect, I did not want her taking credit for what was not hers. And so you see how the imperfect soul comes to perfection by fighting these battles. Because there she experiences, again, experience, experiential knowledge, she experiences my divine providence, whereas before this, she only believed in it. I have now guaranteed it to her through experience, and she has conceived perfect love because she has come to know my goodness and my divine providence and has thus risen above her imperfect love. So she talks in this chapter how God's providence deals with those who are not in union with him, those who are in union with him yet are imperfect, and then how divine providence deals with the perfect. She kind of looks at those different um, levels. This is nice, too. This is somewhat related. He talks about St. Agnes of Montepulciano, again, a city uh, not far from Siena. 
And there's a beautiful story of St. Catherine of Siena visiting St. Agnes of Montepulciano's uh, monastery and her body there. And uh, St. Agnes raising her foot, <laughs> the corpse of St. Agnes uh, raising her foot as St. Catherine goes to venerate her foot. Um, there's a famous story of a St. Agnes, and there's paintings that capture this, of her monastery being uh, without bread, without food. And she cries out to the Lord for uh, his provision. And then um, suddenly uh, bread shows up. Um, similar story in St. Dominic's life. And so St. Catherine of Siena recounts this in this dialogue 150. God the Father says, I told you I provide by multiplying things. At the time I was telling you about, Agnes turned her mind's eye to me in the light of faith and said, my father and Lord, my eternal bridegroom, did you make me take these daughters away from their father's homes to die of hunger? Provide, Lord, for their need. And God says, it was I who made her ask. I was pleased to test her faith and her humble prayer was pleasing to me. So that last sentence, we can take a principle as a principle for things broader as well. Even things, times where it seems like physical needs, the Lord doesn't seem to meet as well as we would hope sometimes. You know, sometimes we're sick and we pray for recovery and sometimes it doesn't come. It doesn't come as quickly as we would like. Um, and But the same principle holds. I was pleased to test her faith and her humble prayer was pleasing to me. God treasures that humble prayer that we cry out in our poverty and poverty of spirit and our need. He really treasures uh, that humble prayer. And a lot of the trials in life help that, to create that humble prayer in us. So it is doing something beautiful in our souls, even as we are uh, kind of in dire need physically or, or in, in whatever. And it's to make our faith come out uh, like gold in the furnace, First Peter talks about that, right? More precious than gold tried in fire is our faith as it passes through trial. The theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity bring out what's best in us. Uh, they are what's best in us, supernatural virtues that link us to God. And so when our faith is tried, when our hope is tried, when our charity is tried, it can come out all the stronger, all the more pure. And that's what it's all about. That's what makes our souls beautiful. That's what will make us shine uh, like stars for all eternity. And so it will be worth it in the end as we have to pass on. You know, St. Catherine says something like, you know, don't forsake the rose on account of the thorns. Don't give up on the rose on account of the thorns. Don't let the thorns get in the way of, of you having the rose. And so, yeah, we'll, we will see the rose on that last day. And um, this humble prayer helps to bring about the beauty of soul that God wants for it. And it makes our prayer effective, right? The Lord hears the cry of the poor. We want to be effective, fruitful intercessors. It's good to be poor in spirit, to be humble, to be needy, to be desperate in our crying out. Uh, and, and God allows himself to be bound by our tears, by our sweat, by our humble prayer. Okay. So now let's look at poverty of spirit and its joyous benefits, right? So St. Catherine encourages us uh, into this great practice of poverty of spirit, and there's much, that you, there's much that comes from it. She hears God the Father say, I've shown you how every evil, harm, and suffering in this life and the next comes from selfish love of riches. Now on the opposite side, so, you know, self-love is the root of all evil. On the opposite side, uh, I'm telling you that every good, peace, rest, and calm comes from poverty, that humble poverty of spirit. Only look at the faces of those who are truly poor, how happy and joyful they are. You know, by truly poor, she means, uh, I think, the poor in spirit. You know, look at all these Franciscans running around St. Catherine. You go to this uh, Franciscan church, Look at the joy on their faces, those who are truly poor, how happy and joyful they are. Look at Francis, 
and his poverty, the joy that that poverty brought him, that espousal uh, to Lady Poverty. Look how joyful it made him. Look at St. Dominic, uh, the poor St. Dominic, and the joy that his poverty brought him. So same for us, right? It makes space for the Lord. It, it, clean, it frees us uh, from lesser goods that can weigh us down and frees us for the greater spiritual goods from the Lord. Only look at the faces of those who are truly poor, how happy and joyful they are. The only thing that saddens them is when I'm offended. And this sadness fattens rather than distresses the soul. Through poverty, they have gained the highest of riches, spiritual riches. By leaving darkness behind, they discover the most perfect light for themselves. By leaving behind worldly sadness, they have come to possess happiness. In place of mortal goods, they find the immortal. The greatest of consolations is theirs. Their labors and suffering are refreshment to them. That sounds very much like John of the Cross, right? The poor in spirit, the humble, don't think they deserve anything, right? The, the, the truly humble person thinks that hard work and labor is their lot. That's what they're about. You know, it's, it's the haughty person who complains about hard work. Uh, the poor of spirits think that, oh, yeah, of course, hard work. Uh, is what I'm about. I'm not better than, than hard work. And so their labors and sufferings are refreshment to them because they accept it. They're not better than that. They're not looking for an easy life because they're poor and lowly. They are just and love everyone with a familiar love. They do not play favorites. In whom do the virtues of most holy faith and true hope shine forth? Right? So we're getting the theological virtues. And whom do these theological virtues most shine forth? Where does the fire of divine charity most burn? And those who, by the light of their faith in me, supreme eternal wealth, raise their hope above the world, right? Hoping in God alone, not hoping in worldly success, or um, I have hope because I have a big bank account and I can always depend on it. That's not hoping in God alone. You know, when he provides for us, and it's good to be good stewards, and it's okay to have, you know, a bank account. Um, but sometimes the Lord takes those things away so that we do hope in him more alone. And those who by the light of their faith in me, supreme eternal wealth, right? Our poverty makes space for God's eternal wealth. And they raise their hope above the world and above all empty riches to embrace true poverty as their bride along with her servants. And do you know what these servants of poverty are? Contempt for oneself and true humility, which serve and nurture the soul's love for poverty. Right? So, you know, so by contempt for self, you know, consider the opposite. Like, ugh, you're asking me to do that. Like, that's below my dignity. You're asking me to serve, really? You know, that's below my dignity. You said that about me. I, you know, you can't talk like that about me. Um, but the poor person, like they're freed of all that. Okay. You said this about me. Okay. It's probably, you know, it's partially true. There's some truth to what you say. Yeah. I'm, I'm not so good. Um, okay. Hard work. Okay. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll help you with that. So that, that's a poor in spirit and they're humble and they hold their, their selfishness and contempt. They rise above that haughtiness in all of us, hold it in contempt. With this faith and hope ablaze with the fire of charity, my true servants leaped and leap above riches and selfishness. Right? So it's poverty of spirit that really helps us uh, live out the theological virtues. And then in this dialogue 151, I didn't include this quote because it got kind of long, but she talks about, or God talks about the poverty of the word made flesh. And, you know, though he was rich, he became poor for our sakes that through his poverty, uh, we might be made rich with him. That's one of the that second or first or second Corinthians. And yeah, God himself became poor, born in a stable, born of simple, humble laborer, St. Joseph. And uh, he lived out that poor life. And he uh, showed the way for us. And most of all, he was poor in spirit. And then she continues, then after that, so thinking about Jesus's words uh, in the gospel, and he, he, the Lord Jesus, gave you true poverty as your rule. For scripture laments in his name. 
foxes have dens and the birds of the air have nests, but the virgin sun has nowhere to lay its head. Who knows this? You know, who's like attuned to this? Those who are enlightened by most holy faith. In whom do you find this faith? In the spiritually poor who have taken as their bride queen poverty. For they have cast away the riches that bring on the darkness of infidelity. This queen's realm is never at war, but is always peaceful and calm. Right, Mother Teresa says something like that. That the truly humble, like nothing can harm someone who's truly humble, right? You can attack someone's reputation and that can harm someone who's haughty, uh, but someone who, who's poor, like, and humble, you, you, they're like, you, um, you can't harm them, right? A chandelier that's fragile, a person whose soul is like a chandelier <laughs> and every little bump, Every little criticism can break them. Um, then, yeah, everything can harm them. But a truly humble soul, you know, what can harm him as far as, you know, human reproach or other people's words or, you know, battles with other people. Um, always peaceful and calm because he's poor enough that he doesn't, you know, get into disputes about reputations or about possessions or about anything. This queen's realm is never as war, but is always peaceful. She overflows with justice, this queen poverty, because the thing that perpetu perpetrates, perpetrates, sorry, that perpetrates injustice is cut off from her. Her city walls are strong because their foundation is not in the earth, nor on the sand that every little wind scares up from the earth, but on the living rock. The gentle Christ Jesus, my only begotten son, there is no darkness within her, but fire without any cold, because this queen's mother is divine charity. Queen poverty, right? And our foundation, our security, our rock, not built on earthly things. You know, whether our material well-being, whether our reputation, they all can be based on earthly things. But no, it's built on the living rock, Jesus Christ. It's built on the next life. We're like that inverted tree that St. Augustine talks about that has its roots in heaven and its branches uh, reaching towards the earth. But to have our roots in heaven, our foundation being eternal things, uh, then nothing can shake us, not the sinking sands of this life. The city's adornment is compassion and mercy. The city whose queen is poverty because the cruel tyrant wealth has been put out. There is benevolence, that is, neighborly affection among all its citizens. There is enduring perseverance and prudence. For poverty does not act or govern her city imprudently, but watches over it with great concern and prudence. Thus the soul who takes this gentle queen poverty as bride is made master of all these true riches, for the two go hand in hand. It's a path to, to these virtues, compassion and mercy, humility, not entering into battles over people, over anything. So here's a famous um, depiction of the meeting of St. Dominic and St. Francis, both lovers of poverty, Holy Father Francis, Holy Father Dominic, and Queen Poverty. Yeah, I wonder why St. Catherine, you know, instead of calling her Lady, Lady Poverty, like Francis would, it's now Queen Poverty. Just came to me. Perhaps, you know, maybe it's the masculine thing. Um, and so um, so for Francis to have a feminine uh, lady, he's after uh, poverty. Uh, St. Catherine being a woman herself, uh, queen, queen mother poverty, or uh, queen, queen poverty. Um, I mean, Catherine also speaks about being espoused to poverty. But anyways, um, queen of, of heaven as well is queen poverty. Okay, just uh, some more on what uh, poverty brings us. All virtue, all grace, all pleasure, all delight. The soul who takes queen poverty as bride finds all the virtues, all the graces and pleasures and delights she could desire and more. Right again, it's that poverty of spirit, that emptiness of spirit that's receptive to receive from the Lord. These virtues, these graces, these delights. 
empty hands that can receive from the Lord, that can receive the Lord himself more and more, right? This is the greatest gift. Jesus says the Holy Spirit, you know, ask, seek, knock. And in Luke 9, he, you know, he says, you know, what, what father who asked for a piece of bread would give him a stone or asked for a fish would give him a serpent. Well, so is your father in heaven. How much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? So God himself is the greatest gift of all. And that's what our poverty makes space for more and more of God. She has no fear of vexation, someone rooted in poverty, for no one is at war against her. She has no fear of hunger or want because her faith sees and trusts me, her creator, and the source of all her wealth and providence, for I always feed and nurture her. I never fail those who never fail in their hope. I provide for them as a kind, compassionate father. And with that glad generosity, they come to me because they have come to know by the light of faith that my providence always has and always will provide for every spiritual and temporal need. True, I let them suffer to make them grow in faith and hope and so that I may reward them for their labors, but I never fail to give them anything they need. You know, I mean, keep in mind and all that, you know, that, that God's ways uh, are filled with mystery. His way of providing isn't always the way we think he should provide. It can sometimes be larger than our plan. In everything, they sweetly experience the depth of my providence, tasting in it the milk of divine tenderness. And this is why they do not fear the bitterness of death. Rather, they run on with eager longing, dead as they are to selfish feelings about themselves. Right, that's key. Dead to selfish feelings about ourselves. Egotism. Um, overcome bit by bit. Um, dead as they are to selfish feelings about themselves and riches and possessions, arm in arm with poverty, their bride. They are people in love and alive in my will, ready to endure heat, cold and nakedness, hunger and thirst, anguish and abuse, and even death, and their desire to give their life for love of life, that is for me, for I am their life, and to shed their blood for love of the blood. Okay? Right, and then so now, you know, we can point to circumstances where people do die because they don't get enough food or something or do die. Um, and so what about God's providence there? And so, again, the emphasis is on, you know, spiritual things and eternity. Um, and these trials in life can be built in a greater reward for eternity, uh, more pure heart, poor heart that's ready to receive more. And so then St. Catherine kind of looks at this right in the face by looking at the martyrs, right, who do die. God didn't save them from death. Uh, the glorious poverty of the martyrs who gained all. She looks at St. Stephen, filled with such delight as he's being martyr, martyred. Look at the poor apostles and the other glorious martyrs, Peter, Paul, Stephen. Look at Lawrence, who seemed to be not over the fire, but over the most pleasant of flowers, joking, as it were, with the tyrant and saying, this side is cooked, turn me over, and start eating your meal. The fire of divine charity was so great that in his soul's filling, he regarded the lesser fire as nothing. And to Stephen, the stone seemed like roses. Right? You know, Acts itself recognizes his face shone like an angel's. What was the reason? The love with which he had taken true and perfect poverty as his bride. He had left the world behind for the glory and praise of my name and espoused poverty by the light of most holy faith with firm trust and ready obedience. These souls became obedient both in fact and in spirit to the commandments and to the counsels given them by my truth. They are desirous of death and scornful and impatient of life, not because they wish to escape toil and weariness, but because they want to be united with me, their end, God says. And why are they not afraid of death, as people naturally are? Because poverty, their bride, has made them secure by taking away their attachment to themselves and to riches and to the things of this world. Right? Poverty frees you. It frees you in this detachment. And it fills you with spiritual consolation. It opens you more to, to spiritual consolation as you trust in the Lord. 
Thus, with virtue, they have trampled their natural love underfoot and have received this divine light and love that are beyond nature. So wherever you turn, you find in these souls perfect peace and calm and every good thing. So the rich are left sad while my poor are happy. I hold them to my breast and give them the milk of great consolation because they leave everything they possess. Because they leave everything, they possess me completely. The Holy Spirit becomes the nurse of their souls and their little bodies in every situation. Okay, I guess even as Stephen's little bodies being stoned, but uh, certainly the Holy Spirit becomes the nurse of their souls uh, in every situation. Okay. Um, all right. So, so last, last one on, on poverty, and then we'll move on to the next theme, affection and uh, special friendships. Poor and then so filled with God's superabundance. So again, I love this, this image of St. Catherine taking in the infinity of God, his, his superabundance. This is how she ends this chapter on divine providence. Then that soul was as if drunk with love of true holy poverty. She was filled, right, in her poverty, she was filled to bursting in the supreme eternal magnificence. And so transformed the abyss of God's supreme and immeasurable providence that though she was in the vessel of her body, it seemed as if the fire of charity within her had already taken over and wrapped her outside of her body. And with her mind's eye steadily fixed on the divine majesty, she, she spoke to the high eternal father. O eternal father, O fiery abyss of charity, O eternal beauty, O eternal wisdom, O eternal goodness, O eternal mercy, O hope and refuge of sinners, O immeasurable generosity, O eternal infinite good, O mad lover. Right? If you want cries like that to come from the depths of your heart, uh, work on poverty of spirit, work on that humility, work on that blessed emptiness that God uh, loves to fill. And you, God, who are all these things, have need of your creature. It seems so to me, for you act as if you could not live without her, in spite of the fact that you are life itself, and everything has life from you, and nothing can have life without you. Why then are you so mad? Because you have fallen in love with, with what you have made. You are pleased and delighted over her within yourself, as if you were drunk with desire for her salvation. She runs away from you, and you go looking for her. She strays, and you draw closer to her. You clothed yourself in our humanity, and nearer than that, you could not have come. Beautiful passage about the wonder of the incarnation. God can't come any closer to us than becoming one with us. Can't come any closer to us than the incarnation and the Eucharist, which flows from the incarnation. And God is this lover, passionate in love with us, as if drunk. It's a mad, mad and drunken man running after us in love. And St. Catherine seems, you know, she seems okay living with that mystery. You know, it seems to me that you act as if you cannot live without us. Although you don't, you, she doesn't need the creature. She recognizes that. Yet he acts like he does. And she's okay with that paradox. Right? It's, it's okay. We, we don't, we can't connect all the dots. Uh, you know, God is love afterward, after all. And uh, God is a mystery. So, of course, his love is a mystery. He doesn't need anything outside of himself. Uh, yet he, he longs for us with love. It's really amazing. And then she continues, The tongue cannot speak, nor the ear hear, nor the eye see, nor the heart imagine what I have seen. What have you seen? I have seen the hidden things of God. And I, what do I say? I have nothing to add from these clumsy emotions of mine. I say only my soul that you have tasted and seen the abyss of supreme eternal providence. The abyss of God's provision for us, is provided for us, the abyss of God's goodness. I thank you now, high eternal father, for the measureless kindness you have shown me, though I am miserably undeserving of any favor. So again, that mark of poverty, miserably undeserving of any favor, abyss of our poverty, yet the abyss of God's plenitude, the measureless kindness you have shown me. Kind of the two coming together at the end of that chapter on divine providence. Okay.
So that that's uh, divine providence. And another, um, so, so that's another aspect of trust in, in divine providence. Something else that comes up in this chapter that's really interesting is this theme of special friendships. And it's, um, uh, his name escapes me now, I'm sorry. Oh, this is terrible. Father Paul Murray, Father Paul Murray. He has a book on St. Catherine, uh, Preacher of Freedom, or uh, Mystic of Fire, Preacher of Freedom. And in there, he has uh, an essay, I forget the, the title of the essay, but anyways, it, it's about uh, St. Catherine's relationships with others. And that St. Catherine, she had a very affectionate nature. And um, she had close friendships with others. And she was very affectionate towards them. There's even a Stefano. We'll see a quote from one of her letters to Stefano and Stefano's mother. And we see the great affection uh, for this young man that she was really close to. And yeah, they spurred one another on, on to holiness. Um, and then but Father Paul Murray points out that in reading some sections of the dialogue, which we'll look at, and you know, they're included in this chapter on divine providence, we see we can kind of, we, we get the sense that Catherine herself struggled with what she talked about. That sometimes in our whole, you know, so there can be unholy friendships and unholy affection, you know, towards others, affection and unholy friendships. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, but then you have holy friendships. And even within holy friendships, um, sometimes um, with the holy affections, sometimes those affections can become too attached. And God in his providence has to kind of um, have us experience disappointment so our hearts are free for him. Or we experience disappointment so that we're forced to turn to him and have the affection we experience for the other lead us to God and not to stop on the creature. So God's providence just in his workings, just in, you know, sometimes this person you have special a, a friendship with shows special affection to someone else more than you, and you kind of feel hurt. You feel a little envy. And St. Catherine says all those things like that are meant, God is using that to draw your heart back to him. There's a good place for that affection and that holy friendship, uh, but God wants it centered on him. So we'll see how she talks about that. But Paul Murray, you know, points out that this seems to be something that Catherine herself struggled with, not just once, but uh, again and again to find that kind of happy medium. And maybe it's not, you know, about like finding a, a perfect static happy medium, but it is just kind of part of life. Uh, there's kind of an attaching and kind of a detaching you have to do every so often to get refocused on God. And um, and yeah, so let's so let's see what St. Catherine uh says about this oh and just by the way too i mean it can be at first it could it struck me as surprising you know there is a a phase in religious life that was really on the guard against particular friendships uh, like people in a religious order people you're living in community with there it was seen as a danger particular friendships that you should love everyone equally and if, you know, two friars have a special friendship, um, that shouldn't happen. You should have kind of an equal bond with everyone in the community. And so, you know, like the 17, 18, 19, 17, 1800s, um, a strong guard against particular friendships. And so seeing, to see in St. Catherine, you know, she had that notion of that universal love for everyone, but that she still had particular friendships, special affection. You know, Al read of, of Raveau, um, uh, great Cistercian has a whole book on spiritual friendship. You know, that's the early Middle Ages, and it was seen as a valuable thing. Um, and that's more St. Catherine as well, that she did have a special place in her heart uh, for people. And so, yeah, so let's see uh, how she talks about that, right? Wouldn't you be kind of, you may have expected otherwise with St. Catherine too, that she wouldn't have had uh, special affection for this or that person but just loved everyone equally. But no, she, she had a special friendship with people. Let's see how she describes this phenomenon and how we can learn from it and to see how God can help uh, us as well through our friendships. 
So this is in our chapter on divine providence. And uh, God the Father says, I even make use of a holy trick just to raise her up from her imperfection. So, he, uh, so here he's talking about divine providence as it applies to the imperfect soul, souls who aren't perfect yet. I think it applies to all of us, huh? I make her conceive a special love for certain people beyond a general spiritual love. In this way, she practices virtue, lets go of her imperfection, strips her heart of every other sensual love for creatures, even any selfish passion for her father and mother, sisters and brothers, and she loves them for my sake. And with this well-ordered love I have given her, she chases out the disordered love with which she had loved creatures in the beginning. So you see how she dispels this imperfection. Oh, well, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm looking at the slide myself. I don't think you can see it. Sorry about that. Oh, wow, where am I? <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, that's better. So, you know, I think, so we can all see this in life. And maybe we've, you know, had an experience of this as well. We meet a really holy person. And our uh, affection... Our friendship with that really hurt holy person draws us to God. And God uses that affection we have for someone who we're really impressed by, we're drawn to, we're influenced by, uh, and that person helps draw, draw us to God. You know, a, a prime example in St. Catherine's life where she had such an influence on people, and she had a very strong influence on people, one of her contemporaries said this of St. Catherine. Oh, I can't find it. I'm, I'm sorry, look them up. Uh, shoot. Okay, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Okay, but the classic example of St. Catherine's own life where she had that holy influence on someone else was that a friendship with Niccolo the Toto. So he was the man who was executed. Um, and as St. Catherine describes his execution in a letter, now she was there praying with him and that she was there to receive his head when he was decapitated. Uh, and that, so she begins that account by saying, God's measureless and burning goodness tricked him creating in him such an affection and love and the desire of me, St. Catherine says, and God, that he did not know how to abide without God. And he said, stay with me and do not leave me like this. Like this, I cannot be but all right with you and I will die content. And he had his head resting on my breast. I sensed an intense joy, a fragrance of his blood uh, and, and so forth. Courage, my dear brother, she says, for soon we shall reach the wedding feast. Um, but she, she uses that same language here. So here, you know, God says, I even make use of a holy trick. So he draws the person to uh, another person. And through that affection for this person, they're, they're drawn to God. And so God's measureless and burning goodness tricked him, St. Catherine says about this convict, creating in him such an affection and love for me, such an affection and love and the desire of me in God, that he did not know how to abide without God. Um, so that was that's a, a clear example in her whole life where she played that role in another, others. You know, and even as we grow in holiness, we always can meet other friends who draw us, spur us on in our pursuit of God and help us in our relationship with God. So there's a place for holy friendships and affection for the other and that. And I won't read through all of this I don't want to go too much longer. Um, but, you know, of course, there's a big place for love of neighbor in St. Catherine. Communion with others, bringing us into communion with the Blessed Trinity. Oh, here's, here's a quote I was looking for, this last quote on this slide. This is from her companion, uh, Friar uh, Tommaso. She had a special charm, St. Catherine did. And as many people approached her, be they men or women, of every rank and of every profession, she made of them all better and brought them back to God. And, and her charm was uh, involved in that.
you know, um, St. Catherine's deep union with others comes out in this Eucharistic imagery, her close bond to others. Uh, so she talks about, you know, eating souls, feasting on the food of souls and their salvation, um, just like God dwells in us and we dwell in him and Holy Communion especially. So by eating souls, we use St. Catherine's language, it's Eucharistic imagery, them abiding in us as we abide in them. Deep, close bond with others. Okay, here's uh, Paul Murray's words about St. Catherine and these holy friendships. Um, he says, certain passages in the dialogue, and some of them are from our chapter we're looking at, and we'll look at them in a, a second or two, in the, a couple slides. Uh, certain passages in the dialogue reflect in the ordinary vivid uh, drama of human affection, the ordinary vivid drama of human affection. Now the attention of an individual can become focused on another person with a special love and how this deep attachment can become in time the occasion of acquiring, acquiring certain basic self-knowledge. According to the dialogue, this love, this attachment can either develop into a friendship that's wholly positive or into a relationship that's far from perfect. St. Catherine says in Dialogue 144, this is in our chapter, if she is willing to walk wisely in the light as she ought, she will come to love that special person more perfectly. For with self-knowledge and the contempt she has conceived for her selfish feelings, she will cast off imperfection and come to perfection. For I have permitted the struggles and the special love and everything else to bring her to the light of perfection. Right, so, you know, you can have an affection and friendship with somebody and selfish feelings can come up like, okay, why is this friend giving more attention to this other person than me? And then that can hurt us. And we can see like, oh, wow, look how selfish I am here. This is my own ego here. Um, and that can cause us to grow in self-knowledge, see how our hearts aren't purely selfless, that we don't love with a, a pure love, but you know, we're still very much self-centered. And so these relationships with others, and when we are hurt that you know the affection's not re returned as much as the affection that we show or something, all these things kind of show us um, how much our love still needs to grow and how we are still very selfish. And so that can spur us on to virtue as well, this growth and growth, growth self-knowledge. And sometimes the possessive character of love, a clinging, sensual love, can get the upper hand in this special love. But things don't end there, at least not necessary, she says in dialogue or um Against all expectation, this negative, unhappy experience can yield a positive result. Dialogue 144. So I'm not sure if that's quotes from Catherine or Paul Murray. But anyways, this pain, St. Catherine says, Dialogue 144, makes her enter the knowledge of herself. Dialogue 64. This is why I often permit you to form such a love, so that you can come through it to know yourself. And Paul Murray says, what is being stated here is of tremendous import. Catherine, in the process of attaining self-knowledge, had to struggle not just once or twice, but often with the question of her attachment to certain individuals among her friends and associates. This is from another letter, letter 111. We are always forming attachments, Catherine says. As soon as God cuts off one branch from under us, we grab onto another. And to Raymond, she says, I was deluded when I looked for satisfaction in other people. So in times of loneliness, I want to find companionship in the blood, the blood of Jesus. In this way, I will find both the blood and these other people. And in the blood, I will drink their love and affection. That's an interesting way to think about it. Um, to love the other person in God, to find them in the blood of Jesus. We'll see a little later. She, she talks about drinking uh, the water of their love under the fountain of God's love. So you're drinking in their love um, under the fountain of God's love. So it is in God's love and ordered to God and, and focused on God. And here she uses the language of the blood to do that, to find companionship with the other in the blood. And then to in that blood to drink their love and affection and to drink God's love and affection through theirs. To have their love and affection give you a glimpse of God's love and affection that you drink in. 
And this is her affectionate friendship with Stefano Maconi, um, young man about her age, one of her secretaries. And uh, Stefano says of her, she loved me with the tenderness of a mother, far more than I deserved. She admitted me into her closest confidence. And Catherine, in a letter to Stefano's mother, says this, and it's really strong language, do not be disturbed that I have kept Stefano so long, for I have taken good care of him. By love and by affection, I have become one with him. And so I have treated your things as if they were my own. I think you have not taken this in bad part. I want to do all I can for you and for him, even up to death. You, mother, bore him once, and I wish to bear him and you and all your family in tears and in sweat by continual prayers and desire for your salvation. Yeah, so by love and affection, we've become one. And um, you know, and she extends her charity then to the whole family. You, mother, bore him once. I wish to bear him and you and all your family in tears and in the sweat of continual prayers and desire for your salvation. So real affection in Catherine's heart. Um, you know, and in God's plan, we do need one another, and that's meant to, to bind us together in the bond of charity uh, and help us um, to depend on others and to grow in love with one another. So in this affectionate love, St. Catherine notes in Dialogue 144, uh, that uh, this love can be tested. So this is a uh, God speaking. But listen to another thing this sort of love does. It provides uh, this affectionate love, special friendships. It provides a test of whether or not the soul perfectly loves me, God, and those I've given her. This is why I gave them to her, to test this so that she might have something on which she can base her discernment. Right? You know, love of God is related to love of neighbor. And love of neighbor can be a clearer measuring stick of whether it's authentic love. Right? It's easier to test the love of neighbor that we can't see than to test uh, the love of the one that we can't see. Um, and so, yeah, love of neighbor is a good measuring stick for kind of how well we're loving, since love of God and love of neighbor is so intertwined. Um, and so, so, yeah, a lot of these relationships help us to see uh, how our love is, help us to grow this love. This is why I gave them to her to test this, so that she might have something on which to base her discernment. For without this discernment, she would neither find displeasure in herself or pleasure in what is mine within her, right? She'd be kind of puffed up, self-satisfied, thinking that her love is, is perfect on her own, not realizing how much she depends on God and his love uh, to love through her. This is how she comes to this discernment. For I told you before that she's still imperfect. And there is no doubting that so long as her love for me is imperfect, her love for other people will also be imperfect. Her perfect charity for others depends on perfect charity for me, God says. So she will love others with the same measure of perfection or imperfection with which she loves me. Whenever the soul loves someone with a special love, she feels pain when the pleasure or comfort or companionship she has become accustomed to and which gave her great consolation is lessened. Or she suffers if she sees that person keeping more company with someone else uh, other than her. This pain makes her enter into the knowledge of herself. Right? She sees her love's not perfect yet. And if she is willing to walk wisely in the light as she ought, she will come to know that special person more perfectly. For with self-knowledge and the contempt she has conceived for her selfish feelings, she will cast off imperfection and come to perfection. Once she is more perfect, a greater and more perfect love for others in general will follow, as well as for the special person my goodness has given her. Right? So these special friendships are given by God. That we see in that last line. They're meant to help us to grow. They can help us inspire us into holiness, but they also kind of show us how our love needs to grow and how it's still selfish and self-centered, and it helps us to grow into a more selfless love. Um, when we see them spending more time with the other, someone else, and we, 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 let, we let them go. When the time of companionship with them has come to an end or something, and we feel kind of the heart pangs of that, to surrender to the Lord. And allow our heart to be purified in that, to be to be uh, detached, all according to God's providence. And it's all to, to draw our hearts to him, right? Like this picture shows. All our human relationships, all the ups and downs, 
uh, it's meant um, to allow our hearts to be taken in the hand of the Lord and drawn to himself and him giving his heart to us. So here is St. Catherine's solution, or here's how we should um, soak in the love of other people. So, um, so this is dialogue 64, so it's a little earlier in the dialogue. If you have, so God speaking, if you have received my love sincerely without self-interest, you will drink your neighbor's love sincerely and without self-interest. You know, we're coming to the end here, by the way, a little bit longer. It is just like a vessel that you fill at the fountain. If you take it out of the fountain to drink, the vessel is soon empty. But if you hold your vessel in the fountain while you drink, it will not go empty. Indeed, it will always be full. So the love of your neighbor, whether spiritual or temporal, is meant to be drunk in me without any self-interest. Right, so as I note here, it's a little surprising, right? That this image of God as a fountain and drinking under, under the fountain, that makes sense, right? But I would have expected um, to talk about filling your vessel with the water of God's love and then pouring that out to one's neighbor. Um, but here she's she's talking about drinking your neighbor's love sincerely. So it's not just about giving love, showing love to your neighbor, although that's an emphasis. There's also a place for drinking in your neighbor's love, receiving your neighbor's love and that special friendship and that affection for your neighbor. But to drink your neighbor's love in uh, under the fountain of, of God's love that you drink in. And as long as you drink in your neighbor's love, as you're drinking in God's love, your vessel will not run dry. You'll be like that person holding your vessel in the fountain while you drink. It will not grow empty. But when we begin to kind of pull that vessel outside of under God's fountain and get focused on just the other person's love uh, and get possessive uh, about it, well, then our, our vessel will will. will will soon be empty. It won't be enough. But as long as we drink in the neighbor's love under the fountain of God's love and according to God's wise ordering, according to um, you know proper measure uh, and focused on God, drinking in God's love, then our vessel will, will not run dry. She talks about the same thing in a letter, T49. So this accompanies Dialogue 64 well. So she's writing to, I forget who she's writing to, but she says, take, for example, a jug that you'd fill in the fountain and drink from in the fountain. For although you might have drawn love from God, who is the fountain of living water, unless you drank it from it always in God, it would end up empty. And this will be the sign that you are not drinking entirely in God, that the person or thing you love becomes a source of pain to you, either because of a conversation you have or because you have been deprived of some comfort you are used to receiving, or because something else that happens. When these things or anything other than offense against God cause you pain, it is a clear sign that this love is still imperfect, drawn outside the fountain. You know, so those little pains, why is this person uh, who I have a, a special affection towards showing more attention to someone else than me, and that hurts? Um, why is this person not showing as much interest in me as I'm showing in that person? Why do I feel like second choice or something? Um, and those are ways, you know, we all, it's kind of human experiences that can show up in friendships. You know, why does this person receive more attention, that kind of thing? And it can it can hurt, and then it's supposed to help us to see, okay, yeah, my love's you know still there's some selfishness there, uh, there's some selfishness there, and it's the Lord drawing us to Himself. He wants our hearts to belong to Him. He doesn't want us to get caught up uh, too much um, and make the creature uh, into an idol of sorts. And we won't do that as long as we drink under uh, God's fountain. Drink the fountain of drink, uh, the water of our neighbor's love under the fountain of God's love, God's order, proper order, wisdom, um, and order towards God and focused on God. 
Okay. All right, so let's let's end here. These are the last two two verses just capture well. Saint Catherine, even during her life, was known as a mother of thousands of souls, and she did bear that affectionate love uh, for others in her heart. And I think something of her maternity helped her to to love in a in an affectionate way, yet in a way that was selfless, and and not egotistical, e egotistical. Um, but you know, mother's love is more concerned about the child than herself. Um, St. Catherine has a prayer on the visually assumption. I pray to you, God, also for all the children you have given me to love with a special love through your boundless charity, most high, eternal, ineffable Godhead. Amen. That's a good prayer to, to end on. Uh, to all the people the Lord has placed in our lives to care for, to kind of nurture, uh, to um, be a shepherd for a teacher, uh, a parent. Um, you have to pray for them with special affection and that they are God's gift to us um, and a gift that brings a responsibility, a task along with it uh, to rise up to the occasion and uh, give the care and provision that God expects us to. I pray to you, God, also for all the children you have given me to love with a special love through your boundless charity, most high, eternal, ineffable Godhead. Amen. And we surrender everything to that ineffable, eternal charity uh, as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, we've got two more months to go. Uh, so next class, um, three pages 325 to 350. Then after that, we have about 17 pages to the end of the book. And so we'll also kind of go back and do kind of a, a nice summary or concluding section uh two months from now but for next month it's 325 to 350 the chapter on obedience so see you next month god bless you all pray for me i'm praying for you